So, um, welcome, Steve, and thank you very much for coming to Perth. We're all looking forward to your talk. Yeah, I'm very excited about being here. Good. And this is presumably your first time in Perth. Oh, it? no. I've actually been here before. Really? Yes, I have addressed business groups. I've addressed education groups. Um, oh, okay. I've been, yeah, very lucky. I, I do a lot of this, actually. And this was as part of Apple or just No, no, no. Just on my own, yes. Oh, okay. Spousing views and opinions. <laughs> okay. I, more, more than anything else, I try to inspire young people. That's my main thing. Yes. So talking of that, I wanted to just talk to you about education first. And you, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and others um, essentially left university before finishing their degrees and started And I'm, your I'm the only one who actually went back my name was well known by then, so I went back under a fake name, and my Berkeley diploma reads Rocky Raccoon Clark. Right. So, so I got mine, finally. <laughs> so uh, why did you feel that it was important to finish your degree? You'd already succeeded. Okay. You'd already. You'd done all you, you know. Had I'd been done. successful, but I had never sought business success. I had never sought wealth, money, power. I had only wanted to bring great computers to people as an engineer, and I had three years towards an engineering degree done. I only had one more to go. And I could tell my kids I went to college and I, where I graduated from that I was proud of, like my father told me. And so what, what degree did you end up actually getting? Oh, um, uh, WECS, Electrical right. Engineering Computer Science, hardware and software. It was, uh, it was an early point in time. Remember, when I started college, Introduction to Computers was a graduate course. Right. And as a freshman, I got my A plus, but, <laughs> um, but <laughs> no. So, so anyway, it was engineering at Berkeley. So when you first started, I know there, there's some confusion on Wikipedia. You left Colorado under a, a somewhat of a, a potentially a cloud. What, so, what so, so I, I don't, I don't try. I ever read even things like Wikipedia about me because I assume it's a lot of wrong stuff. Because in books, I just nothing ever comes out right. Um, I left Colorado for one reason. I, when I got my A-plus in that class, I wrote every program I could to calculate tables of numbers that scientists use, and I ran them five times over budget. I didn't know there was a budget. I thought they have a computer, and they let you use it if you're in the class. And this budget thing, I was so scared. It was more than out-of-state tuition. I mean, it was something like today, maybe it'd be $100,000 that they're talking about. I ran a class over, and they might charge me that money. So I didn't try to go back. I was too afraid my parents might discover, you know, the stuff about it. But that it doesn't matter. I got, I got well-educated wherever I go. It was in my own head. As a matter of fact, look at the computer stuff. I, I really knew almost everything in the classes um, back and taught myself in high school. So did you encourage your kids to go to university and uh, finish their um, education? I, I, I only serve it as, a, as an example, and I try to talk about the benefits of going to college, but I speak to it to my own children more that it's the most fun four years of your life. Nobody's going to want to miss out on the most fun four years of your life. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly, and I have a heartfelt feeling for people who are in poor communities who don't even want to graduate high school because they're not going to be able to afford to go to college. You know, I wish we could do more for them. So there, there's been much talk about disruption of the higher education sector, especially with massive open online courses. Do you see that this is a sector that's ripe for disruption? And do you see MOOCs as potentially that way? I think MOOCs are very adequate for higher upper level education, university level. I do not see them for primary education up through like what we call high school. Um, because they're just like a boring book and it's, a, it's an example, it's an assignment that I've been given and I have to do. It's not like your best friend is doing something along with you and you're a team. It's not the same sort of thing. So I don't think they are as good as if we had one great teacher per student. And even computers don't give us that. A human being, one great human being yes. teacher. At least computers don't do it yet. Yes, so when you first built the, the, the Apple One, you talk about in your book about um, programming in BASIC and that people would be potentially learning BASIC as okay. a first language. Turns out that I had never programmed in BASIC in my life. I had programmed in scientific languages, Fortran, Algol, PL1. BASIC was like a kid language, but games. It was used for a lot of games. And I knew that for a home computer, for computers to ever come in the home, games were gonna be the key. The Apple One could run some very simple computer games in BASIC, 
but it was not the revolution. It came as an accident, a quick accident of modifying something else that I had designed before. The real computer design was the Apple II, and that was the first time ever arcade games. That means games with little moving colored objects on the screen were going to be color. They were never color before. Atari was making arcade games for arcades, and they were black and white. It was the first time that they were software, meaning that a kid could write, let vertical equals one, let vertical equals two, let vertical equals three, and move things on a screen that easy in real time. And they had never been software before. When they were hardware, you had to study all these chips and signals and electronics. You had to have, you know, 10 years of a training almost, and it would still take half a year to design a new video game that was an arcade game. So the Apple II was the revolution. But the Apple I, people looking over my shoulder at the club where I gave it away, they saw that's the formula. A keyboard, a little program that's re looking at what you're typing on the keyboard, skip that, all that front panel with the big old computers full of switches and lights that you see on TV shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, so that was, that was really the formula for, a, for an affordable personal computer that was useful. But it wasn't quite a completely done, it was like an Ikea, Ikea of computers. You had to, you bought a board from us with all these parts on it, but you still had to buy a keyboard and hook it up. And you had to get some transformers to hook it up. And you had to get a wooden case and hook it up. So the stores sold all the parts and it was just a little bit of assembly. But did you see at the time though that um, kids at primary school potentially would be taught a computer language and uh, that would be based on the work that you had done? Um, almost more than any other single reason, that was the reason I designed these computers. I was in a, a community, a club, of people that included college professors talking about how education was going to be transformed once we had computers that could give you a question, you type what you think the answer is, and then it explains to you you're right or wrong, and here's why, and here's what it was, and reteaches you. Education was going to be like it was never before. So I was a great, a skilled designer. I was a designer, and I had my head, I was like five years ahead of where everyone else, what they were trying to build. So I, um, I built the real useful computer, and I, like you said, I had to write my own basic, just like Bill Gates did. <laughs> you don't have a computer without being able to type in programs. And um, no, it was very, education was important to me. I was scared that the kids, once they had computers, were going to be so smart that we adults were going to be out of business. So do you think Apple now, with Playgrounds, they're promoting Swift as a, a programming language for school kids to, to learn, and the Playgrounds application on the iPad? allows them to do that in a graphical way. Do you think that's really a transformation now in terms of educating children on STEM and computing? I, I think it's really great. There are little simpler languages than Swift and um, that are being used. My son even teaches some to young kids, but programming languages, but anywhere. Being able to buy inexpensive projects, build them up, turn them into something that impresses other people. That's, you know, we had little hobby kits when we were young, pure electronics, flip the switch and push a button and a buzzer goes off, you know, simple little things. But now you can, you can do that. And programming is really the heart of it. Learn how to program and what a program is all about. Only a few of us are going to just say, I want to do this for life. But those should, but they should have the, exa the, the advantage of seeing it at least. Public schools don't always explain to you what that's all about. Technology, the way you're going to change the future, come up with an idea of a better way to do something, even educate. Um, you, don't, you don't really get the opportunity to do it in most schools. It's not like, like a course and yet that's the most important thing you might do in your life someday. Yes. So talking about um, changing the future and, uh, and starting businesses in Australia with investment um, as it stands at the moment, Potentially, Apple wouldn't have been um, funded uh, in Australia as if it came along today and, and pitched that idea. What would you say to young people sort of starting a startup and trying to look for that investment? The, the success of the personal computer industry on through laptops and internet and mobile devices and smartphones, all of this is so prominent that um, it's opened up the eyes of a lot of the world. That A lot of people have money everywhere in the world. And even in the poorest countries, so people have big money, are they willing to invest it in these risky technology things where you don't know if it's going to go over or not? It's almost like making a song. It's almost like making a game. If you can do a lot, something really good that can help people and not get the sales, just didn't have enough demand and compulsion to buy it. So I think Australia is moving way up in that regard. Everywhere I go in Australia, I've even been, been talking to people in Australia for about 30 years, but in the last 10 years, more and more and more every year, emphasis and interest in um, 
being a part of this technology creation, you know, digitizing the world. Every single business, whether it has anything to te technology or not, is becoming digitized because digital, the digital world and, and all the, the, the tablets and the communication methods and all that, it's just improving our life. Yeah. Um, in terms of the way that engineers are portrayed in popular culture, there's been now a number of series you actually spearheaded, really, you know, sort of the rehabilitation of the engineer in society. People are taking us a little bit more seriously. And in fact, in popular culture, we're seeing series shows like Big Bang and Mr. Robot and Halt and Catch Fire. In fact, Halt and Catch Fire sounds uncannily like your story of... Uh, going out. Oh my gosh, yeah, have, I love you, that. Have you watched these series and do you um, think they're portraying Although, although I haven't watched the entire series, I actually got to introduce them before they ever came on on the air with that show. I got to introduce all the cast and and talk about it at a presentation at um, South by Southwest. So you've so, been on Big Bang. And so I know what it's about. I know what it's about. I've been on Big Bang Theory. Um, but you know what? A lot of these things we say popularize the geek because of people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and myself and coming up from nowhere out of school, young school kids with an idea. Um, humble start can take you somewhere. But oh, man, I, don't, I really think if you go down to school, back to school, you're going to find that these little geeks that know how to do all that stuff aren't that any pop more popular than they were. <laughs> I, 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 maybe, maybe some people talk about it, but I think it's at an older age when life has come to mean something to you. And wow, starting your own thing, having a business is, is important, that it, it gets more um, you know, recognition. Maybe by university level, yeah. but not before. I think before university, it's, a geek is still kind of you, something people don't want to necessarily be. It's like, I'm stuck here, I'm not normal, but I love doing what I'm doing. So Apple has taken a very strong stance on, on privacy and, and to the point of even defying government popular well, opinion and the FBI. Do you think that's the right thing for Tim Cook to have done? Just about every major technology company has taken a strong stance on privacy. Apple's the only one that kept their word. They do it. They do it for real. They don't just talk the talk. We're giving you privacy. Nobody will get your data except us, a lot of them say. No, Apple says we even we won't get your credit cards and your history and all that, and um, they're the most trustable, and I'm very proud of that. And so do you think that was Tim Cook that brought that culture in, or do you think that existed prior to Tim? I think it existed prior to Tim, but I think I'm very thankful that Tim is at the head of things because the head is, is the ultimate uh, decider, and I'm glad to see it all happening. It's, um, it's rare. He's, he's even stood up to the FBI, and you know what? Apple, he's made a point. Apple will gladly help the FBI in legitimate ways, but people have to have a part of their personal life. There's a reason for privacy, that you can have things in your life and you'd be too scared to talk about. It. Your behavior becomes very modified and very constricted if you don't have uh, enough privacy. Yeah. So in Australia, currently Apple's in a slight dispute with some of the I banks. Um, what do you think the, of the bank's position? Oh. That one, that one I don't know. I do know that Apple Pay is in Australia, and I walk up to every pay terminal, and I just pay with my watch, and it's so easy. And we'll have a ring. Visa announced, they, somebody announced they're going to have a little Visa card ring. No, I, so, so these are great things. I don't know what the dispute with the banks is. Maybe it's over what percentages everybody gets. That's one of the reasons we aren't. We, see, we have an international standard on Wi-Fi. If you have Wi-Fi on your computer, it works anywhere in the world the same. But all these banking systems and mobile payments and ones that are you know, online and you're stored um, um, digitally on your computer, on your, on your smartphone, everybody wants their piece of the cut. And there's no one standard. There's a whole bunch of, bunch of everybody's trying to get in and get their way. But do you think Apple should have uh, opened up the NFC uh, wireless radio to um, an API? And I haven't thought about that one deeply, but usually when I think about it, I say at least to some, in some ways, a lot of these technologies should be open so that everybody can jump into one standard. And, uh, but Apple's way is a lot, well, we want to make sure you have to, we get the, you know, your money using our system rather than, I think licensing the system around very reasonable rates or make it an open standard would help it happen. I would love there to be a worldwide standard, like one credit card that works everywhere. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, very much, uh, Steve, for uh, joining us. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so you've got to be on stage, so I look forward to it. Well, thank you. Wish we had more time, <laughs> thanks. thanks.